Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. The hymn which ends the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. At the beginning of our worship in church on the four Sundays of Advent, we light candles, one more each Sunday, until Christmas Day, when we light a fifth candle, which reminds us of the birth of the light of the world. For our online worship during Advent, you might like to find five candles of your own and light them one by one each Sunday too, or just a single candle to light each week as we begin our worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who at your first coming sent your messenger to prepare your way before you, grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world we may be found an acceptable people in your sight. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. The first reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. My brothers and sisters, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The Gospel is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. 
Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptising. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. A while back, BBC News 24 did an interview that's unintentionally gone down in history. It was meant to have been with a man called Guy Cuny, editor of a technology website, who'd been asked to provide an expert opinion on a legal dispute going on at the time. Unfortunately, it just so happened that while Guy Cuny was waiting in reception, another man, Guy Gomer, arrived for a job interview for an admin post, and he was also asked to wait in another part of the reception. You can guess what happened. Guy Gomer, the would-be admin worker, ended up being hustled into a studio and found himself on air, live, expected to give a learned comment on the legal niceties of this rather obscure case. He said later that he realised as soon as he was introduced on air that there'd been a mix-up, and you can see it written all over his face in the videos of the interview. But he knew that the programme was going out live, and he didn't want to embarrass the interviewer, so he just ploughed on and did the best he could. To add insult to injury, after putting this poor chap through this ordeal, he didn't even get the job he'd applied for. Perhaps he'd have done better in his intended interview if he hadn't had to do the unintended one first. It's the kind of thing many of us, quite literally, have nightmares about. Priestly anxiety dreams often involve finding yourself having to lead a service at the last minute without any of the right books or robes. But I know it's not just us. It happens to people in other walks of life too. They dream of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, with the wrong equipment, having done the wrong or no preparation. It's a very common nightmare. I suppose it's a manifestation of imposter syndrome, that feeling that we don't really know what we're doing and someone is sure to find us out eventually. In today's Gospel reading, we meet someone who's very keen to avoid any sort of mistaken identity. Someone who's very keen to tell us who he isn't and what he can't do. John the Baptist has been attracting large crowds as he calls people to repentance, preparing them for the coming of God's long-awaited Messiah. He's at pains to point out, though, that this Messiah isn't him. Nor is he the Old Testament hero Elijah or the prophet, probably meaning Isaiah, who some people thought would turn up when the Messiah did. And in the opening verses of the reading, we hear that he isn't the light either. Like his questioners, we might feel that we've found out far more about who he isn't than about who he is. But John's disclaiming of any special status isn't false modesty. It's clear that he knows his work is vital. John wasn't the light, we're told, but he bore witness to it, noticing God at work in someone who was still just a face in the crowd to others, an anonymous carpenter from Nazareth, and he pointed him out. Bearing witness is an important and sometimes challenging thing. If you're a witness in a court of law, you not only have to say what you've seen and heard, but also be prepared to stand up for the truth of your testimony because a great deal might hang on it. Your testimony might take a dangerous person off the streets, or it might prevent an innocent person being wrongly jailed. And each witness is unique. No one else can say what you've seen, only you can. Bearing witness to the light might not sound as important as being the light, but without witnesses, that light might not be noticed or understood. 
Mother Teresa once said, Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. I would also say that not all of us are called to do great things, but all of us are called to do small things with great love. It's not just about what we can or can't do, our innate abilities, but about the unique role that God has given us. It may seem like a small and insignificant role, but we might be the only person in the right position who can do it at that moment. And in the end, life is made up of small things after all. It's what we do in the seconds and minutes that are given to us that shapes the months and the years and ultimately the lifetime we live. The passage we heard today from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is mostly about small things too. Paul doesn't tell people to change the world. He tells them to hold fast to what is good and abstain from what is evil. He tells them to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, to live, in other words, with the expectation that God is at work in the ordinary, everyday ups and downs of life. Paul doesn't call them to do anything heroic. No miracles, no signs and wonders, no big rallies or set-piece speeches. Just to live out their daily lives faithfully to do those small things with great love. Advent and Christmas can often feel like the opposite of small things to us. We can feel burdened with big expectations, under pressure to try and be something we're not. The perfect cook, the perfect Christmas tree decorator, the perfect present buyer. And if things don't go to plan, it can feel like a big disaster too. People worry that Christmas will be ruined if they forget the brandy butter or can't get hold of the right sort of cranberry sauce. And this time of year can also bring with it unrealistically big visions for the world as well. Peace on earth, goodwill to humankind, an end to poverty and trouble. That famous story of the World War I Christmas truce when enemy soldiers played football in no man's land took hold on the popular imagination because we want to believe that Christmas is a big magic solution to all that's wrong with the world. Actually, though, war and peace both come about because of a multitude of small decisions, small steps that lead in one direction or another. Perhaps then this is a good moment to remember that God calls us first and most often to think small, to pay attention for him at work day by day in the ordinary things and people around us. We don't have to save the world. It's already been done. We don't have to have all the answers, even if we find ourselves accidentally on live TV being asked for them. All we have to do, like John the Baptist, is to look for the light of God, even if it's just a pinprick in a dark sky, and be ready to bear witness to it. As St Paul says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And the one who calls us to this is faithful. He'll do the rest. Amen. As we bring our prayers to God, so we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you. Scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.